Welcome to at and Threat Track for July 23rd, 2013. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. I'm joined today by John Hogeboom and a new participant in the program, Steve Beck. Well, actually, Steve, you aren't entirely new to the program, but uh, please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, tell us a little about what you do. Uh, I'm coming out from behind the curtains. Uh, and usually I am uh, uh, the lawyer who listens to the uh, threat track recordings and uh, tries to uh, help the team to put together a better show. And uh, I'm really happy to be invited to participate this week on an interesting legal topic. At least I hope it yes. is. Yes, and we're looking forward to that, Steve, and thanks for joining us. And, uh, you know, the way I kind of think about it, it's our responsibility to be honest, but uh, I guess you help us to stay within the legal bounds. So with that, I'm Brian Rexrode, and uh, let's go ahead to our first story here. I will pass it to John Hogaboom, and uh, no shortage of back doors, John. I think I've said this before. Uh, it sounds like you've got another sort of slant on this back door thing. Uh, yeah, so this is a, a twist on something that, you know, we've talked about probably in the past, I'm sure. So if you're familiar with, you know, when websites get compromised, a lot of times the attackers will leave behind or they'll implant on those compromised web servers something called a web shell. It's usually some kind of PHP script or Perl script is something that they can access via a URL to that website and they can, you know, um, basically get remote administration capabilities of the machine that's running the website. Uh, so this is a little bit of a twist. So the guys at Security uh, last week, uh, they put a blog post up uh, talking about they observed a, a slight twist on this. Instead of actually hiding the uh, web shell directly, kind of out in the open as a script, what they've done is um, they've actually hidden the code inside the EXIF tags on an image. So when you, and if you're not familiar with EXIF, maybe I should uh, uh, punch up that slide real quick. So on an image, uh, some images have this, some don't, but it's basically tags that are embedded inside the image and you don't really see them. Uh, the image itself renders on your browser, but behind the scenes, there's a bunch of tags that are sometimes left behind. And a lot of times they'll have things such as, you know, what type of camera took the picture, and sometimes they'll have uh, geographic information, where the image was taken, uh, various things, the date it was taken, et cetera, et cetera. So what these guys have done, this particular attacker, is they take an image that's actually part of your website, they download it themselves, well, you know, once they compromise your machine, they take an image that's legitimately yours and they'll add in some EXIF tags to one of your legitimate images and replace it on the web server. Then what they do is they have uh, just one script, it's actually two lines here, that they have to actually um, engage. And they'll have to embed this somewhere inside one of your scripts. It could be in the index.php, something you might not even notice because it's only two lines. And what it does is it reads the EXIF data from a particular uh, JPEG that they've compromised on your website. They've, you know, pet these extra EXIF tags in there. In this particular one, they're, they're using the make and model tags inside the EXIF information. And if you actually looked at one that was compromised, they do an interesting trick here. They, they run preg replace, which is just the regular expression replace command. Uh, but what they do is the first tag, make, has a slash dot star slash E, and then the second tag has at eval base64 decode and then a whole bunch of gobbledygook uh, in base64, which is actually instructions to run. This slash E uh, notation here tells preg replace that I want you to execute whatever this is in the next section here. So in a very obfuscated way, unless you're really looking at your code, what this is doing is it's reading information out of the JPEG image and the EXIF tag and executing it. And what they've been really uh, doing here is they'll, um, uh, they'll send a, uh, a post command to this and uh, it'll be base64 encoded and whatnot, and then they can use this string here in order to uh, execute whatever command that they push to that uh, PHP script. So it's an interesting way uh, of hiding the actual backdoor web shell uh, inside the image and then just having a couple of lines that kind of loads it into memory and runs it. 
one other thing I wanted to um, uh, mention is if you're, I guess, the, in terms of what you should do to protect yourself, a lot of times when people find their website is compromised, uh, they will reformat it, re-image it, but then they'll restore all of their data into their web directories. And if you don't know how, you know, how long ago you were compromised, you might be returning your compromised JPEG and possibly whatever PHP script that's loading and engaging the, uh, the tags inside there. So you want to be very careful that when you restore your machine, you're not restoring the malware back onto the machine with the web shell. Uh, a lot of things like Tripwire would help with this. If you have some kind of uh, software running on your website that's looking for any changes to files that occur in your web directories, I think Jim and I have talked about this before, especially even if you have a little website of your own that's not supposed to change much in terms of the content that's down on the hard drive in your web directory. Uh, you can run a script that's just kind of looking for anything that changes on those um, uh, on those files and notify you if something changes, uh, which if it is, it's probably because it was compromised for some reason or you did it yourself. All right. Yeah, so, John, I guess I have a few questions about this, and I think, um, you know, first of all, sort of an observation. You know, the notion of JPEGs actually being malware isn't new. Uh, I mean, in the sense that, you know, we've obviously seen cases where malware has been renamed with a JPEG extension, and that clearly is a different situation than here. You're actually, it's a legitimate JPEG that's been modified to include some, uh, some malware associated with it. Now, I, I guess uh, on a sort of a related note, can you walk us through really kind of briefly what the attacker's motivation might be here? I'm kind of thinking that maybe this is sort of a path to do something else. Well, uh, I think the motivation is to retain persistence. So, you know, the, the goal of putting this down on the machine is so maybe they, they discover some exploit in your web server and they can drop this on there to begin with. Um, but if you go and clean up and restore, you might be restoring the very web shell back to the machine and not have any concept that it's there because it's one of your images for the most part that it's hiding in. And if you look at that image, it renders fine, even though they've modified it and added in their own EXIF tags in there. Um, so, you know, it's, I think the reason they hide this is mostly the probably obfuscate, but also to maintain uh, persistence in there in case, you know, you do discover it and try to, you know, restore your machine and, and um, re-image it, um, you might, you know, restore back what was there before and they'll be able to regain access to the machine. Even if you patch the compromise that initially got them in, you, they mm -hmm. could still access that remote administration toolkit that they're dropping and hiding inside this image. Yeah, very good point. I think that's, uh, I think you have it right on. And so, you know, the motivation, I mean, beyond that point, perhaps is uh, data theft off of the web server itself, or perhaps uh, one of the things we'll be mentioning a little bit later is uh, drive-by downloads. So it means to uh, distribute malware, which may in fact, you know, be very, you know, short-lived. They may put, post something up for just a few minutes or something and then, then pull it out. And your, your point, persistence, having access to that web server after, you know, some obscure web, uh, excuse me, exploit had been identified. Fairly uh, seems to be the, uh, the opportunity here. Yep. Um, now, I guess the, you'd mentioned tripwire is one method for, as a countermeasure, one that sort of came to mind to me, and, they, and you have more experience at this than I do, so perhaps you can uh, shoot this down, but, you know, good software configuration management, I think uh, from a business continuity point of view, you want to be able to replicate the web server or make changes on it or have a test environment that is, uh, is exercised before going into production. So if you are faced with rebuilding web server, I would recommend building from not a backup, but perhaps building from the uh, code base that's used in the test environment. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I would agree. And um, that would apply for a large website. Uh, I think probably that's a smaller portion of the types of websites that get compromised by this. You know, we've seen in general a lot of these smaller websites on these LAMP installations, you know, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP type of environments where home users are setting something up, maybe with a content management system mm -hmm. or some third-party software that has a vulnerability. Um, those are probably the richer target spaces 
for this type of attack. Uh, and they generally don't have very good types of source code control like you're talking about, like a, a larger website might have for a commercial type uh, enterprise. So, you know, uh, I agree with your, your position. You know, if you have that capability, it would be better to go back to your source and restore it mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to go, bring back any backups, especially if you, you know, um, if you're not sure when the machine was compromised and whether it's in the backup image itself, you're, mm -hmm. you're actually, you know, the malware itself. Okay. And just one uh, final brief point. You, you mentioned the EXIF headers. Uh, I think this is one of the things that's been overlooked in the past. You know, uh, sometimes cameras will add uh, location information to EXIF headers, and uh, so subsequently when they get posted on, you know, on the Internet, uh, folks will have an awareness of where you are at the time or other things, and I think that's uh, kind of led to uh, some criminals getting um, identified, which is a good thing, but it, by the same token, it could... Uh, lead to, uh, you know, exposing information that you aren't aware of otherwise. Just a little sort of tangential aspect of uh, what you um, mentioned here. Very good article. I think that's uh, a good story. Thank you very much. And, you know, on that point, a lot of your smartphones automatically do that. They'll add geolocation tags onto images that you take with your smartphone. Mm -hmm. And then you might post it to Facebook or some other place. And someone smart enough, they can just grab that image and look at the access tags inside and actually see um, maybe some details about where you actually physically are and whatnot right. when you took the picture. Yes. All right. Once again, thank you. Uh, next item here, what uh, I'd like to share with you is, you know, uh, John, you had just actually gone through a fairly detailed explanation of what I would consider to be, you know, some very subtle nuances about uh, security and protecting websites. But, you know, every once in a while you might be talking to a neighbor or uh, talking to somebody that uh, doesn't live and breathe, breathe security activity uh, like uh, many of us do. You might need to be able to explain some things. You know, if somebody asks, what can I do to protect myself? And, uh, you know, what are the types of things that uh, scammers do? So I happened to run across, across an article. This one happened to be in USA Today just uh, this past week. And I thought it was a pretty good rundown of the types of things that uh, your typical user needs to be kind of be, be paying attention to. Uh, certainly, you know, five points here that you want to be uh, considering and how the attackers attack you. And uh, we'll cover, you know, a good portion of what you need to be paying attention to. So the first one they mentioned was phishing scams. This is this case where, you know, somebody posts a website, tries to draw you to it perhaps through an email, and uh, the objective there is to get your username and password. What they're trying to do is post a site that looks like one that you would normally ask, uh, access and uh, sort of, um, you know, fraudulently get you to, uh, to disclose your username and password. And these have uh, gotten to be quite clever in the way they do it, uh, the way they direct you to these uh, sites. Uh, I won't go into the nuances of that, but uh, certainly that's one of the scams that they use. Second one will be a Trojan horse. Uh, cases where they're trying to get you to load some piece of uh, malware onto your computer, and uh, the consequence of that is that they have the opportunity to steal information directly off of your computer. Uh, we see these, in fact, John had been reporting about this on Threat Track some time ago. Uh, just uh, tons of, uh, in fact, a lot of the spamming email that we uh, uh, deal with these days actually has malware or points to malware that is intended to uh, basically take control of your computer and be able to steal information from that. Uh, the next one is related to drive-by downloads. In fact, uh, the topic that, John, you just talked about, uh, being able to compromise web servers, one opportunity here is to uh, load malware onto that website and actually have it downloaded as content when folks, uh, legitimate folks or otherwise legitimate folks, uh, visit that site and it would compromise their computer again, giving them the opportunity to, uh, to steal information from your computer. Um, bypassing passwords, either through brute, brute force attacks. Uh, we talk many times about scanning activities and brute force attack activities against uh, various types of sites or uh, applications. Uh, once they get their password, they can act like you in that, in that uh, site and perform fraudulent activities. So for example, if you have a poor password, at a uh, merchant's website and they have your credit card information, uh, somebody would be able to, uh, to uh, do purchasing on your behalf on your credit card and then you have to kind of recover from that. 
And then last but not least here would be uh, using open Wi-Fi. You know, it's become uh, very popular to use uh, Wi-Fi services, publicly accessible ones. Uh, it's important to pay attention to the fact that anybody else on that Wi-Fi access can monitor the packets that are go going across that link. So if you're doing anything where you might want to be concerned about the privacy of your information, you need to make sure that you're using a, uh, an SSL protected session to, uh, to protect that. And I guess the, uh, the article, I think, is more directed toward your home Wi-Fi and making sure that your home Wi-Fi is configured correctly so that it provides encryption capability. I don't know, John or Steve, do you have any thoughts about uh, maybe some ones that were missed here that uh, probably should have been covered? Well, I'll throw one out real quickly. Uh, one that came to mind that we've been seeing a little bit more over the past few years is vishing scams, which are like phishing, but it's okay. voice phishing. And uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the a lot of the types that we see of this is uh, usually it'll be somebody representing Microsoft or other some other vendor, and they'll be calling you on the phone saying that you have you know an infection on your computer, and they'll try to walk you through social engineer you through getting on your computer visiting a website that they want you to go to, uh, which will allow them to gain remote access control of your PC uh, and install, you know, whatever they want on there, really. Um, I, we've heard a lot of cases of this happening, even inside the company. I've heard of people that get calls at home and whatnot, uh, you know, related to this type of attack. So just, it's, I think it's rare that it happens. Um, it's rarer. But it's interesting when it does. Uh, I'm sure we've talked about it on the program before as well. So that's another one to keep an eye out for. Yeah, absolutely. So there, there's, uh, there are certainly variations on these themes here, uh, vishing versus phishing. Um, and uh, I guess the, the lesson that you're pointing out here is don't ever underestimate the audacity of somebody that might be trying to scam you from afar. That is, um, you know, when they're perhaps uh, thousands of miles away, uh, it uh, gives them some level of protection of uh, anonymity, and then they're going to try to take advantage of that. If I may add, I, I thought there were a couple of other fairly prominent uh, options that I, that unless I missed them, I don't think were quite in there, like the variation on the Trojan horse where instead of using an attachment, you just use a website like in the phishing uh, scan uh, that will uh, permit the you know the bad guys to uh, uh, load something on your on your machine and, and the other thing that I thought was interesting is that uh, I think you were trying to allude to that uh, when they talked about having your Wi-Fi uh, encrypted or, or secured um, they were talking about home Wi-Fi which is important but um, I think on the show you, you all have talked about the importance of being careful in public Wi-Fi spots uh, as well not quite as simple but still only one or two steps required yeah. to, to be much safer. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely true. So, um, and, and there are some little subtle differences in those two different circumstances. In particular, mm -hmm. you know, I think the, uh, the, the USA Today article points out that, you know, somebody could monitor home Wi-Fi just by driving down the street. And, in fact, uh, there was um, uh, a little bit of a hoopla with Google some time ago, which uh, in, inadvertently... Uh, they said inadvertently had gathered information from a lot of uh, Wi-Fi yeah. networks around as they were um, doing other of their mapping activities. And, but that's, uh, you know, it, it just sort of points out how simple it really is. Uh, whereas if you're using a public Wi-Fi access point, it's generally not encrypted. And uh, in any case, it's, you know, you still want to make sure that you're protected. In any case that you're on a Wi-Fi network, even if it is encrypted, other participants on that Wi-Fi network will be able to, uh, to gather whatever takes place on that Wi-Fi. So even if, for example, you go to a limited access, it might be in a hotel, it might be in a, uh, a school or something like that, and somebody provides you a key, others on that network would also be able to, to uh, basically sniff those packets. So even with the encryption, you have to be paying attention to uh, you know, privacy considerations and, and security. And on open Wi-Fi, you can run into cases where, you know, there might be a rogue element on that Wi-Fi co-located with you that's, you know, advertising false DHCP information or false DNS information uh, to your machine when you join that network, such that now he's kind of running in a man-in-the-middle kind of operation with you. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, 
depending on where you are, you might you'd be probably less likely to see that, you know, in a you know, uh, you know, maybe a Starbucks or something, as opposed to if you go to the Black Hat convention or something, and use their open <laughs> Wi-Fi. You want to be really careful there. But you, you catch my drift. Depending on where you are, you should always be wary, and you should always have some kind of uh, local firewall on your PC to try to protect. Because when you join these open Wi-Fi networks, you don't really have any other type of protection at the network level. You'd want to have something very close to your machine, so run your Windows firewall or whatever you know operating system firewall you might have. Mm-hmm. All right. Good points. Okay, now uh, next story we'd like to cover here is uh, I'll introduce Steve. And uh, Steve, I am interested in learning more about uh, cybersecurity law, and I guess uh, there are perhaps some differences between the way uh, it's done in Europe in comparison to the United States, and I was kind of curious what you could tell us about it. Well, thanks, Brian. Thanks for asking about that. Um, Yeah, what brings this up is uh, in the European Parliament uh, earlier this month, they passed uh, a measure that they've been looking at for quite some time, which uh, it's called a directive, and it essentially directs the nation states in the EU uh, to look at their criminal statutes regarding cyber attacks. And the most interesting part of it is the part about uh, cyber attacks affecting the critical infrastructure, uh, which is defined over there very similarly to the way we define it. Uh, It could be public or private, uh, but it is uh, an attack on infrastructure that is vital uh, to the country. So it would include major transportation, uh, major fuel uh, and power, uh, obviously telecommunications and other communications technology, things like that. The directive, uh, the meat of it, tells the nation states that they must, within two years uh, of the passage of this uh, directive, They have to look at their legislation regarding uh, sentencing for cyber attacks affecting uh, critical infrastructure, and they have to make sure that they have a maximum sentence in that statute that is no less than five years. They can be higher, but the the maximum sentence must be at least that high. So uh, the U.S. actually has uh, something quite similar. Uh, We set maximum sentences in our statutes typically as well. And in the statute that most likely uh, would be used to prosecute a a cyber attack on critical infrastructure in the United States, which is the CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the maximum uh, sentence is 10 years, so double uh, what the EU uh, has uh, has put in their directive. Since we don't really know how uh, the EU directive is going to uh, play out in, uh, in in reality, and we don't really have great data on how it plays out in the United States, our 10-year maximum, uh, I did want to see if we could come up with any further uh, analysis on um, how one might expect uh, a, a real um, cyber attack to be sentenced in the United States based on what are called our sentencing guidelines in the United States. These are a set of guidelines, as as they are aptly titled, uh, that courts must consider, but they do not need to follow them uh, if they have a good reason not to. Uh, But typically, courts don't vary much uh, from the sentences recommended in the guidelines. So I uh, fortunately found the U.S. Department of Justice has a a manual for prosecuting cybercrimes Uh, on their website and uh, uh, got most of my information, in fact, about U.S. law uh, from this document, and that includes a very helpful section on how to uh, calculate sentences under the guidelines. And essentially what what I found is in order for a cyber attack on critical infrastructure in the United States to generate a sentence somewhere in the five-year range, which is you know, the same as the EU's maximum uh, sentence, would really be a, what one would probably consider a fairly minimal uh, uh, cyber attack if it was intended to be on uh, critical infrastructure. And, and by that, I mean uh, it would have to have had less than 10 victims. Um, it would have to have caused less than $5,000 in losses. Um, and there would have to have been no attempt uh, by the defendant to conceal his or her identity or the identity of their, you know, botnet or whatever they were using. And that's quite rare, by the way. 
Yeah, I would assume that's extremely rare in an attack of that uh, size and uh, audacity. Right. So, um, so because I assumed that would be rare, I also kind of uh, ran uh, not an extreme scenario, but what I would assume is a, a couple of fairly rational scenarios uh, for a critical infrastructure attack. Uh, and, and the first one I, I ran, uh, both of these, by the way, would, would uh, end up with a recommendation of the maximum or more, but because the maximum is called the maximum, you know, you can't go above that even if the guidelines tell you you should. Um, so, so I'll give you two examples uh, where you would get to that result. Uh, the first one is, again, you have an attack on critical infrastructure. You still have less than 10 victims, and you still have no attempt to conceal the defendant's identity, but the defendant uh, caused or even intended to cause, it's, it's either or, either or uh, $2.5 million or more in losses. Uh, and that's a pretty broad definition, loss, so it's pretty easy to get to that number. Um, so again, that's a pretty conservative estimate of the kind of damage someone would intend if they were going after critical infrastructure, I believe. And then the other example that would still get you to the 10 years would be uh, defendant used an online proxy or some other method to try to conceal his identity. And he caused or intended to cause as little as a million dollars in, in, in losses still would get the maximum most likely under the guidelines. So you can see that most attacks on critical infrastructure in the United States are going to end up hitting the max most likely. Obviously, what you're, what you're describing here is a uh, sort of a hypothetical example that certainly uh, sort of points out that, first of all, you don't want to be, uh, you know, whimsically uh, doing attacks like this, certainly against critical infrastructure, even uh, if it's just probing around, because there would be uh, potential for incidental damages along those lines. And uh, right. pointed out, it doesn't matter what you actually intended. It could, it, the fact that it results in those types of losses would be almost as significant. Yes. Oh, it's a, just as significant. Whichever is greater, your intent, your intended damage, or the actual damage that you caused. Right, and you know, uh, you know, oftentimes application providers or, or folks that are responsible for applications are even uh, uh, apprehensive about legitimate scanning activity. They just to test systems to make sure that they don't have security vulnerabilities. I think they're, in some cases, trying to save themselves from embarrassment. By, but by the same token, uh, there is also the concern that it might disrupt the application, uh, have an impact the users, and certainly in cases like this, you wouldn't want. Um, that sort of scenario as well. But so the point being is somebody that is not, you know, professionally trained and, uh, you know, even just probing around and looking for uh, vulnerable systems and might stumble across something that might, is associated with, um, uh, you know, critical infrastructure could put somebody in uh, sort of an uncomfortable predicament from a legal standpoint. At least that's my impression here. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, in, in actuality, in the sentencing guidelines, they specifically have three different levels of enhancement to your penalty uh, for a critical infrastructure uh, attack. So uh, a critical infrastructure attack that has uh, what's referred to as debilitating impact uh, mm -hmm. on the national infrastructure, which that would be a, a rather big uh, successful attack, you know, from the attacker's point of view anyway, that uh, gets you a, a huge uh, basically unlimited uh, option to increase the sentence on the, on the part of the judge um, up, and, up to the maximum. Uh, I was analyzing uh, the, the examples that I was giving you under the uh, middle tier, which is when you have a significant uh, impact, and or, uh, I think it's significant or substantial, um, mm -hmm. which is probably where most infrastructure attacks that have any level of success will, will fall into. And then the, the smallest level uh, is uh, called mere access, which is to say uh, you may have done no damage whatsoever to the critical infrastructure, but if, as long as you got in, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's enough to get you some measure of increase uh, to your sentence that you wouldn't have otherwise uh, had, had to face. And two, two other things, kind of caveats that I meant to mention at the beginning. First of all, Obviously, I'm um, not an expert in, in cyber crimes. I kind of put this research together over the past few days. 
and I feel very comfortable in it, but I uh, don't want anybody to be relying on it as legal advice, and, and of course, uh, that would be unwise on your part as well. Free advice is usually yeah. worth what you pay for. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, quite frankly, um, at, legal or not, I think it's good advice to stay away from uh, these types of activities. In fact, uh, I'll be talking with some... I feel very comfortable in giving that advice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think, um, I, I guess it's sort of looking at it from a counter perspective, uh, certainly you would want to, wouldn't want to try to make the argument that because there are some strict penalties against, uh, for, you know, making uh, attacks against critical infrastructure, uh, you certainly wouldn't want to make an argument that I don't need to pay any more close attention from a security standpoint, uh, you know, saying that they, the, the legal aspect is a deterrent. By, uh, we know for a fact that there are those that uh, are, in fact, uh, doing these things, and uh, we hope to be able to bring those folks to justice at some point. But ultimately, it comes to the, uh, you know, both ends of the spectrum. We want to create deterrence from a, a legal standpoint and also uh, make sure that the uh, proper protections are put into place on those systems themselves. Oh, absolutely. I wouldn't rely on, on, on these laws, as tough as they are, uh, to protect your, your network. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. And uh, once again, I very much appreciate you to, uh, to bringing this to the, uh, the program. I think it's, uh, it's good to get these other, you know, other perspectives. Uh, the legal perspective, perspective, obviously, not as technical, but it's good to understand. And the thing that caught my eye is that uh, there are, in fact, provisions in terms of the guidelines and sentencing that uh, take into account critical infrastructure, and I wasn't aware of that previously. So. And that's, uh, that's actually a longstanding piece uh, of the guidelines. And uh, glad to hear it. So let's take a little bit of a look at the uh, internet weather for the last week. And uh, there's one actually set of activities here that I don't have a graphic for, but I want to at least mention. Uh, we see a lot of probing activity that is across a number of different UDP ports. Um, it's uh, created some uh, alerting. I don't have, like I said, I don't have a good graphic to show it because it actually is spanning across literally hundreds of ports. And so um, I'm going to try to investigate this a little bit further, but uh, suffice to say, you might want to uh, keep an eye out for that sort of activity. I don't know what the origin of the activity is to a large extent and uh, the, the cause behind it. So um, as I said, I'm going to be investigating that a little bit further. Uh, but with that, we do certainly have uh, uh, sort of what I'd describe as some a relatively normal but notable activity. We've reported on this topic a number of times before. This is related to scan sources, uh, the number of sources that are scanning on port 53 UDP. Obviously, uh, port 53 UDP is associated with DNS, domain name service. And uh, this is typically botnets. Uh, what we're, as I mentioned, it's a number of sources that we've seen increasing and creating anomalies along these lines. And typically what we're seeing here, well, there actually isn't really a typical number. I would say sort of an average of around 150 sources scanning on port 53 at any given time. And uh, we're seeing spikes as high as uh, 600 sources or so and uh, not infrequently up around 350 or so. So like I said, typically these are botnets that are scanning around. They're probably looking for open DNS resolvers that can be used as a part of uh, DNS reflection or DNS amplification attacks, which, uh, in fact, what I wanted to share with you is uh, a little bit of information about the frequency of these attacks that uh, we happen to be observing. This particular graphic here is showing between November 2011 to uh, June 1st, 2013. So it's not exactly up to date. I probably should update it, but I wanted to at least share this information with you. Around June in 2012, there was a significant increase in activity that is the number of attacks we see in a given day. Uh, it went from, you know, maybe about 50 or so attacks per day up to on the order of about 400 or so attacks per day and uh, peaking up around, uh, looks like about uh, 600 or so attacks in a given day. That trend has continued to increase. In fact, um, sometime around in March, we saw a, actually a peak event where they were on the order of about 2,000 plus attacks in a single day. So uh, that's a pretty significant increase in the popularity of uh, DNS amplification attacks. And uh, a typical average around now is on the order of about 700 attacks. That is different IP addresses that are being attacked in a given day. So uh, it is important to be sort of paying attention to these. 
not just from the point of view of you might become a victim of an attack, but from the point of view of making sure that if you are operating DNS servers, that you're paying attention to either make sure that it is not an open resolver, and if it is an open resolver because you need it to be, make sure you have controls in place so that it cannot be abused, uh, put monitoring in place to uh, see if it is being abused in the context of DNS reflection attacks. Uh, next item here is, uh, and that, again, another uh, uh, activity associated with reflection attacks. This one is not as significant in terms of popularity as well as the uh, you know, sort of the impact associated with these attacks. Uh, this is related to uh, increase in bytes on source port 161 UDP, and uh, that's associated with the simple network management protocol. Our advice here is don't expose systems that are SNMP enabled to the internet. Uh, at least put in uh, access control lists so that uh, only uh, legitimate systems that are supposed to be probing SNMP ports for that activity. And uh, what we're seeing here are the, uh, basically the effects of attacks, and I think I reported on this last week as well, it shows up frequently in our sets of anomalies. The typical activity is on, you know, not all that frequent. It's a lot more uh, spiky in terms of the uh, amount of activity relative to the DNS reflection attacks, but typical attacks are up around 100 megabits per second. Uh, we've had some occasions certainly where they're going above that. And uh, this is just the uh, re basically reflecting that source port 161 activity, uh, it is possible that fragmentation can, of packets can create uh, these attacks, make them much larger. We haven't I've certainly heard cases where that's been the situation, but that does not seem to be the typical scenario. So in any case, these are denial of service attacks. They can impact uh, organizations. Again, something you want to pay attention to. Don't expose SNMP to the Internet. And a lot of times people might have... Um you know, embedded devices that don't even know are supporting SNMP. So a lot of DSL modems, cable modems, those types of devices, when they get put on the network, uh, by default sometimes uh, have SNMP enabled. So you may or may not even be aware of it right out of the gate, but it's something you might want to check for those types of devices. Well, and John, I think you bring up, I mentioned um, uh, just a little bit ago how application owners tend to be reluctant to scan systems for uh, vulnerabilities. In fact, that's just a good argument right there that, you know, look at the outside of your network and s scan that network. Um, you know, check it with application owners, but scan that network to look for things that not just scanning the things you know are there, but scan the things that uh, you think aren't there and might be. So uh, your, your point is well taken. You want to make sure that uh, ports aren't open that you didn't expect to be. Uh, next item here is um, scan probes. On port 8088 TCP, I think I reported on this last week, it's registered to Radian HTTP. It's basically been relegated to an alternate port or proxy port associated with web activity. And uh, I don't remember specifically what the source of uh, scanning activity was last week. I think it is actually kind of tailed down a little bit. But uh, in this case, we have a couple of source IP addresses, a uh, couple meaning two uh, source IP addresses that were identified. Uh, both of them in China, and uh, there are some little differences between the scanning activity between those two IP addresses, so it's not entirely obvious that they're uh, working together here, but one uh, short sort of shared characteristic is that both of them were scanning other ports as well. So, uh, and some of the other ports, most of them in the 8,000 range, uh, 8,000, 8,001, 8,009, 8080, 8089, 8800, 88. 99 and 9003 were uh, some examples of some of the other ports that these uh, two sources were scanning. So in any case, it's kind of spiky activity that's probably them sort of sweeping across the address space on the Internet and uh, has been sort of going on since uh, July 8th uh, with some very subtle activity since uh, before then. And uh, we sort of had a spike uh, actually just today that was uh, um, associated with that activity. So. Again, uh, port 8088 TCP uh, scanning activity on them. I guess my, uh, my interpretation is that they're likely looking for opportunities to uh, anonymize or perhaps look you know, through uh, an open proxy or uh, looking for uh, opportunities to uh, exploit machines. Next item here is basically our usual pie chart. This is activity associated with July 22nd yesterday, and uh, this is the most probed ports. 
this one I, I would describe as fairly typical. Uh, not any, well, I guess there is one little surprise here. Uh, we talked about probing activity on port 53 UDP, and uh, in fact, uh, port 53 UDP got the uh, top spot for the most probes uh, on yesterday for uh, July 22nd. Uh, second, 45 TCP, uh, 1433 TCP, Microsoft SQL database is the next one here. Uh, port 3389, that's remote desktop protocol, is next in line. And then uh, port 8080 TCP, we talked about, uh, you know, the port 8088, and uh, this particular one is um, uh, generally associated with uh, an alternate web port. It's also associated with Tomcat a lot, oh, yes. Tomcat administrator right. port. And, John, how many times have you had to point that out? <laughs> <laughs> uh, port 443, port 80, both of these also associated with, that, with web applications, so uh, this is kind of indicative. Uh, or suggestive that a lot of uh, web uh, sites are being probed perhaps for uh, uh, vulnerabilities. And then uh, typically we do see port 22 and port 23, port 22 showing up on here is uh, being probed. And then uh, we reported on this last week as well, port 135 TCP, this is uh, associated with the uh, sort of the traditional uh, Microsoft NetBIOS activities. And it's kind of a mystery to see that one again. Uh, I thought most of that had been aged out at this point, but uh, we still see very old potential exploits uh, being tried. In, in terms of the most sources doing that probing, port 445 TCP gets uh, the top slot by far. I would say you know, it's about 30%. Uh, but in any case, uh, other ports that are showing up on here, I mentioned port 23 TCP earlier, port 80 TCP we talked about already. And we see a couple of here, one here that's uh, innocuous, this port 27015 UDP that's generally associated with gaming P2P activity and uh, shows up as sort of scanning, but it's not really uh, a malicious intent. And then we also see the peer-to-peer -peer activity for the zero access botnet as we normally do. That's 16.471 UDP, 16.465 UDP, and 16.464 UDP. Which incidentally, if you're, uh, if you're involved in uh, uh, enterprise security, uh, looking for those ports on your enterprise firewall logs is, uh, even if you have UDP blocked, is a uh, pretty good way to identify end machines that uh, are infected with the zero access botnet. It's uh, one of the largest botnets out there, so uh, it's one you want to pay attention to. Although I think it has actually uh, lost a little bit of its oomph in the last several months. That's our show for today. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, we encourage you to do that. If you have suggestions on the program or feedback, or uh, maybe I said something that uh, you didn't really like or you thought was uh, not quite correct, I really look forward to your feedback. You can contact us at ThreatTrack at list.att.com. Uh, you can find us on Twitter as well, uh, our handle being at ThreatTrack. And uh, the ThreatTrack video is available from the ATT Tech Channel, that's att.com slash ThreatTrack, or it's also available on YouTube, and you can subscribe to a uh, audio-only version on iTunes. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, John. Thanks, Steve. I really appreciate your contributions to the program. We'll be back next week for a new episode, and until then, keep your network safe.